Okay, good morning, everyone. So good to see you. You know, one day, a long time ago, I was playing with some friends. We had a big stack of hay bales. Do you all know what a hay bale looks like? It's pretty big. It's dry hay. It's dried grass. Dried grass, and they call it hay. And they're bundled with wire, and they're like rectangles, and they're very large. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they're very large. And these were all stacked up in an empty part of the field. And behind the field was an alfalfa field. Okay, We were playing on the hay bales on the stack because it was real high, and we were having just a great time. But a couple of the boys, you know, they like seeing things fall apart. For some reason, they threw a couple of the bales over the edge. And I don't know if that happened the night before or that day, but they were on the ground. And we were just playing and enjoying ourselves, and suddenly we heard a familiar sound. It was a truck. It's an old, old truck with a flat bed on it, just a, just a bed. And it was, I'll call him Mr. T. He was driving up the dirt road, and see, this was hay, his hay bale stack, and the, that was his. And we heard him coming and we were afraid, okay? So we were having fun, right? We were having fun. Then we heard the truck, and Mr. T was driving right to us. Then what happened? We were afraid. We were really afraid. He stopped his truck right, right on that dirt road, and he saw us running. To the, we tried to hide in the alfalfa field. Now, alfalfa isn't very high, so you, you can't hide very well in it, but he saw us go there anyway because we were afraid. Now, most of us didn't do anything. We were just playing. And so he stopped his truck and he said, now I know where you are. I know I saw you. I know where you are. He said, if you're gonna, I don't mind if you play on the hay bales, but please don't break them. Please don't break them. And he said it with a kind voice and very patiently. He did not yell at us. He did not get out of his truck and run after us. And then he said, um, you know, you can go to the orchard. The orchard was down the road just a little bit from where we were. And there were apricot trees there. And every year the apricots would get ripe. And they were so tempting, you know, for, for children. And so he said, you can eat the apricots off the tree. But please do not break any of the branches. So... In one breath, he was telling us, please don't break. And he saw that there were some broken on the ground. Do you think he had reason to yell at us, maybe? Be angry with us? We broke some of his property, you know. Those things belonged to him. And maybe we shouldn't have been playing there. But he said, it's okay if you do. Just don't break anything. And if you are going to get some apricots, it's okay. Just don't break any branches. In other words, don't damage my property, please. He was very patient and very kind. Do you know Jesus has much more patience with us than Mr. T had with us? But in that time, he was so kind and patient. You know, I have never forgotten this man, never forgotten him. So Jesus, though, has more patience than that with us. When we make mistakes, he will forgive us, you know. There is a reading that I'm going to have someone read for you because it's very important to remember. It's from Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not 
dealt with us after our sins, nor, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Thank you. And that's Psalm 102, verses 8 through 10. So the Lord is merciful and gracious. I am so thankful that this man was merciful to us, and he treated us very kindly, even though maybe we didn't deserve that. He could have punished us harshly and told our parents even that would have been harsh. But he was merciful. But God is even greater in mercy and plenteous in it, you know. And he will not, he will not keep his anger forever toward us. So remember that. Just remember that you can always go to the Lord. You don't have to flee from him. You don't have to run away if you do something that you shouldn't have done because he loves you and he loves you greatly. Okay, thank you for listening. Let's have a little prayer, okay? Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your grace and for your mercy. Thank you so much. Help us each and every day and help these children to learn more each day of all the love that you have for them and the things that you hold in your hands for them. And I thank you, Father, for your blessings today. In Jesus' name, amen. We found a phone, a cell phone uh, from the back pew. If you have lost a cell phone, please see one of the deacons in the back. Join me in kneeling as we invite the Lord's presence to be with us, please. King of kings and Lord of lords, thank you for your Sabbath day. We invite you to be present here with us. Turn our mind, our thoughts, our eyes upon you today. And may we gain strength uh, from your Holy Spirit and from your word. May you bless our singing as we praise you today. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. O 
come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Let us praise God together in his sanctuary. Please turn to 462, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine, 462. special song about this special day happens to be one of my favorites crowning jewel of creation blessed sabbath made for man 385 385 Ascending, shed forever. 
like to invite you to join us now, hymn 203. Let us stand together and sing this beautiful hymn. This is the threefold truth on which our faith depends. And with this joyful cry, worship begins and ends. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. You believe that? Amen. 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 Two, zero, three. Today's offering is for the North American Division Women's Ministry, which was first established in 1898 at the urging of Ellen G. White. In the book Evangelism, we find her marching orders to the women of the church. The Lord has a work for women, as well as for men, that they may take their places in the work in this crisis, and he will work through them if they are imbued with a sense of their duty and labor under the influence of the Holy Spirit they will have just the self-possession required for this time. The Savior will reflect upon these self-sacrificing women the light of his countenance and will give them a power that exceeds that of men. They can do in the families a work that men cannot do and a work that reaches the inner life. They can come close to the hearts of those whom men cannot reach. Their labor is needed. This is in Evangelism 464. All across North American Division, from the United States to Canada, from the Bermuda to the Guam, Micronesia, the women of the church are engaged in serving others. They give Bible studies, hold evangelistic series, and minister to those in shelters for battered and homeless women. They provide for the needs of families seeking refuge on our shores from oppressive regimes teach English as a second language class, tutor children, and make bags of love for children who are displaced from their homes and their parents. The women of the church are making a significant difference in their communities and their congregations. I invite you to make a generous gift today to affirm their work and ministry. Would the deacons please stand for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning thanking you for all that you do for us 
We praise you and we thank you, Father. We come now returning the gift that has been given to us, and we pray, Lord, that these monies would be spread throughout this world to do the work that needs to be done in your church for the women's ministry. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen, and thank you, Lord. As we prepare for our morning prayer as a congregation, I would just like to share with you some people that we need to keep in mind as we pray. Of course, you see the names listed here, the Goodwin family, uh, David Hagen, Marshall House, Roger Hauser, Mario Jusen, Darla Erickson. But this is the last Sabbath of Sister Stepper's mom. Is that correct, Sister Stepper? This is her last Sabbath with us, and we want to wish you safe travels uh, as you return home and come back again soon. We also would just like to mention that Sister Barnes, and you may not know, but she had hip surgery. And uh, so remember her, she's doing much better. And Sister Maddox, she is going to have a cornea transplant this coming Thursday, I believe it is. So we want to keep all of these people in our prayers in addition to the list that we have here. Um, and our visiting friends, let's remember them. Of course, our senior members as well. 
So as we prepare our hearts and our minds to pray, let us sing our song, If My People, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. The words are in the inside of your bulletin, and we invite you to sing along with us. who are able, let's kneel together. Father in heaven, how good it is to be able to call you Father. You are our creator our sustainer, our redeemer, the one who loves us most and loves us best. Oh God, we come before your precious throne today to thank you for all of your goodness and your mercy, for all that you've done for us in the past and what you're doing for us right now and what you are about to do for us in the future. We thank you for your saving grace. Lord, we just thank you for your love. There is no God like our God. Lord, we just praise you today. On your Sabbath day, your people have come to worship you in spirit and in truth. So we come and we give you our hearts our minds, and we ask that you will help us to be overcomers. Yes, we know we need forgiveness of our sins because we are sinners and we have sinned. But I pray that you will not only forgive us of our sins, but that you will give us power to overcome those sins. Lord, we pray that you will take us higher and higher in our walk with you, that we will love you more and more each day that we will spend time with you and focusing on you. We're thankful that we have visiting friends who've chosen today to be with us and to worship with us. We're so thankful to have them here today. We're thankful for our members who are faithful in their giving and tithes and offerings to help the church function in its ministry of outreach, to sustain the church in its utility and its, all of its bills. We're just thankful to you, Lord. And Lord, there are people in our midst who are maybe not feeling as well, and we pray that you will be with them. We're asking that you will be with our senior members. We have a 90-plus club, and we're asking you to be with those people who are 90 years old and over, Lord. They're precious in our sight, and they're even more so in your sight. We're asking you today, Lord, if you would kindly be with them and then be with the young children. Be with them and bless them. Be with all of us in between. And we're just thankful. And there are those who are looking for jobs. We pray that you will help them find a job. There may be some today who have jobs. We pray that you will help them to do a wonderful, wonderful job wherever they are. Oh, Lord, we're just so grateful. And we ask that you today will be with those mothers, those ladies who are carrying the unborn children. And we pray for each one of them. 
that you will bless them and keep them in your care. And now we give you our pastor, the one who will speak to us today. He will speak your words and he will take us higher in our walk with you. We pray for him and ask that you will bless him, that you will keep him always in your care and his family. For we ask it in the name of Jesus, a name that is above all names, and we praise you, Lord. Let the church say amen. Today's scripture reading will be from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, starting at verse 14, reading until verse 22. Again, that's Revelation 3, 14 through 22. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. I, I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not, thou, not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Sabbath peace to the sons and daughters of Levi. What a marvelous day. Representatives of God's true church in heaven and representatives of God's true church in earth are met here as one. It has been 50 years since I stood in this spot to sing at Stone Tower. In those days, I was young. Now I am old. Uh, pastor Morehouse, Philip Dunham was the pastor here. Florence Abel was sitting on the Balkum and Vaughan organ that had been specially crafted for the church at 11th and Central before they moved it here. Gary Friesen was at Tabernacle, John Todorovich at Stone Tower. Those were very interesting days. Today I thank Sister Audrey Parker for inviting me to sing here and I thank her husband, Brother Carl Parker, for his friendship through the years and Today I thought I would sing a song that I heard some years ago back at Oakwood University. 
Um, it's an American gospel hymn, and it was um, written and music produced by Charles Albert Tinley. It's an old song. It came out in 1906 under the original title, Someday. But today they've retitled it, Beams of Heaven.
Heavenly Father, that is our hope and our prayer. That the choices we make today and the leading of your spirit today would work out so that we can be with you when you come on that day. I pray that you would influence us Change us, stir us. Bring about the reformation that the Laodicean message is supposed to bring about in the Laodicean church. Help us to receive it today. Speak to us through your Holy Spirit, we pray. And may we receive it in the light of Jesus, we ask in his name. Amen. Laodicea. Lukewarm. You think of nauseous water. You think of somebody vomiting. Laodicea. Not a message we rejoice in. But today we're going to look at our final church, Laodicea. Most people know it as the lukewarm church, an indifferent church, the church that is just coasting along. Not hot, not cold, not on fire. Not apostate, a church that is seemingly rich and comfortable. The Bible mentions it this way. I know your works, that you are neither what? Cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. God wishes that we were either cold or or that we were, we were hot because you know if you're, you're a cold Christian, you know it. You can feel the icy experience of the absence of the love of God in your life. You can feel the icy experience of guilt come over you. When you're a cold Christian, God's spirit can reach you, can talk to you, can convict you. When you're a hot Christian, you know it. You feel the pulse of the Holy Spirit moving in your life, working in your life. You see miracles, God opening doors. When you're a hot Christian, you know it. But when you're neither cold nor hot, you don't know anything. You think you're hot, but you're not. A lukewarm state is perhaps the most dangerous state that a Christian or a person can be in. Because they have the comfort of their own mind telling them that they're saved. But in the eyes of heaven, they're lost. Laodicea. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The city of Laodicea was located north of Colossa, which happened to be in the same valley just 11 miles from Laodicea. Colossa was the city which Paul sent his letter entitled the what? The letter to the Colossians. So Colossa was 11 miles from Laodicea. If you read through the letter to the Colossians, you will not only find a letter written to the Colossians alone, But the letter to the Colossians is also a letter to the Laodiceans. Did you know that? Colossians chapter 4, verse 16. Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the what? Church of the Laodiceans. And that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Obviously, Colossa and Laodicea were facing some similar things. These two cities, um, well, there was also another city that was close to Laodicea called Hierapolis. 
Hierapolis is also mentioned in the book of Colossians. Colossians 4.13, it says, For I bear him witness that he has great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. So to, to a little ways away, you have Hierapolis. And the other side of Laodicea, you have uh, Colossa. And there in the middle is Laodicea. These two cities were so close to, to Laodicea, are, the message to them is significant. Hierapolis was known for its hot springs and mineral baths where water came out of the ground hot. The white mineral deposits from these hot springs could be seen all over the valley where these three cities were located. These hot springs of water could be used for medicinal purposes. Colossa, on the other hand, was known for its springs of cold water which bubbled from the ground. Laodicea had neither cold or hot water springs. Instead, it had water piped from the hot springs in Hierapolis, and by the time the water got to, to uh, Laodicea, that hot water was neither cold nor hot. It was lukewarm. The water piped to Laodicea was rich with calcium and also a mineral called sulfur. Now, have you, you ever smelt sulfur? What does it smell like? Uh, not fresh eggs. Not, not nice eggs. We're talking about eggs that have been sitting out for months, right? Rotten eggs. Now, if your water tasted like rotten eggs, what would you want to do with it? Blah, spew it out. The water in Laodicea was not only lukewarm, it, it had a nauseating stench. The lukewarm sulfur-like water was hardly good for anything. And this is what Laodicean is known for today. It's lukewarm, nauseous water. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. You're not cold like Colossa, not hot like Hierapolis. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now I want to paint the picture for you with a very relevant story or illustration here from Oregon. How many of you have been to Southern Oregon? Southern Oregon? How many of you have been to Ashland? You've been to Lithia Park? You've been to Lithia Park in, in Ashland, Oregon? No? All right. Beautiful park. Uh, growing up, I used to go to that park all the time. I was born in Medford, and we'd go over to Lithia Park. This is where they hold the Shakespeare Festival every year. Lithia Park. But you know there's something else they have in Lithia Park. And if you're a tourist, the locals will sit by this water fountain to watch you drink. Because in Lithia Park, they've got a water fountain that's tapped in to a mineral spring. And the water isn't sweet water. This water is filled with I don't know what's in the water, but it, it doesn't taste nice. And you see people coming from all over the world to Lithia Park. I remember my, uh, being with my parents, being with my friends, we'd sit near the water park and we'd say, hey, here comes some tourists. Let's watch them drink the water. And as soon as they would drink the water, they would water the bushes. Blah, blah. Oh, man, what do these or Oregonians drink? Mineral water. Terrible tasting water. Probably good for you, but they would cough, they would sputter, they would gag, and they would look uh, with a look of shock on their faces. And why do you think these people spew the water out of their mouth so quickly? I mean, from the outside, the drinking fountain looks like it contains fresh water, cool water, water that can quench a thirsty soul. But they soon discover that the water is not what it seemed on the outside to be. Instead, it is bitter, nauseous, mineral water. This is the picture of Laodicea. On the outside, they look good, but the bitterness of who they really are is displayed by God vomiting them out of his mouth. The message to the Laodicea is 
is about who you really are, not about how, how others view you, view you. It's a challenge for us to look at ourselves as God looks at us. It's a challenge to see ourselves and who we truly are on a Sunday, on a Monday, on a Tuesday or on a Wednesday. It's who you are when it's hot outside and your air conditioning has broke. In Arizona. It's who you are when, you know, you, you, you discover that, that your water tank last night while you were sleeping broke and flooded the house. It's, it's who you are when patience has run thin. It's not just who you are at your best, it's who you are at your worst. Laodicea is a challenge for us to take an honest look at who we are each and every day when we take off our best and we're wearing our true selves. 1 Samuel 16, verses 6 through 7 says this, So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God looks past the things we wear. And he looks at our heart. And that's where David said, Search my heart, O God, and try me. And see if there be any wicked way in me. You know, you have to be an honest person to look at your heart honestly. To be willing to look at your heart honestly. 1 Peter 3, verses 3 through 4, it says, Who's adorning? Let it not be that what? Is it showing on your screens? Who's adorning? Let it not be that. What does it say? Outward adorning of the what? Plating of hair and of the? Wearing of gold or of the? Putting on of apparel. Fine apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the what? Heart. And that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Which in the sight of God is of great price. Laodicean Christianity is Christianity that is concerned with all the externals. A Christianity that is caught up in the forms rather than a Christianity that is focused on internal regeneration. As heretical as it might sound, Christianity is much bigger than whether or not you show up to church and quietly listen to the sermon. Christianity is who you are every single day. It's how you choose to handle conflict with your spouse, your neighbor, or your friend. True Christianity manifests itself in the mundanes of life. When you are in heavy traffic, when you're trying to calm a screaming baby at 3 a.m., when nothing seems to be going right in your life, it runs far deeper than knowing the hymns in our hymn book or being capable of giving a sermon or, or leading one of our Sabbath school classes or quoting a scripture or spirit of prophecy, book or page. It goes deeper than all of that. Laodicea was a... <coughs> Laodicea... Uh, Laodicea, the message to Laodicea is a message that speaks to our core. And the reason Laodicea needed this message so badly is because they didn't get it. Laodicea, the historical city, was a banking city. Extremely wealthy. Uh, history tells us that in A.D. 60, the whole city of Laodicea was leveled with an earthquake. The government, the Roman government, sent funds to help them rebuild the city. Laodice Laodicea was so rich that they took the government funds and sent them back and says, no, thank you, we'll build the city, rebuild the city ourselves. That was Laodicea. We don't need anything. We're rich. Don't tell us what you want to tell us. We're rich. Um, 
It also, Laodicea had a wool industry that was unique. The wool was purple, a dark purple, or a black color, and produced the black cloth that was especially soft. Laodicea also had a special eye medicine that they, uh, that they gave people and produced in the temple of Asclepius. It was called Calerium. You can actually get some of this today, Calerium. So they had, uh, they had wealth, very wealthy. They had uh, the finest clothing, clothing you couldn't find anywhere else, black clothing, like a black purple clothing. And they had uh, eye lotion, eye salve, Calerium. Are you finding any connections with the message to Laodicea? In Revelation 3, verses 17 through 18, the Lord says to a city that had wealth and health and good clothes, you are poor, you're blind, and you're naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you might see. They thought they had it all. Now Sardis had a name that they were alive but were dead. We find in Revelation 3 verse 1, it says, And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Very similar message to Laodicea. They had a name, they thought they were one way, but they were another way. Here we find that Laodicea, thinking they are rich, but really they're poor. Laodicea is in a worse position than Sardis, because Sardis simply had a name that they were alive, but were dead, implying maybe they at least knew inside that they were dead. Laodicea doesn't just have a name that they are rich, they actually believe it. Laodicea thought it was rich, but it lacked uh, gold refined in the fire. What does the gold refined in the fire represent? In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, it tells us what they lacked. That the genuineness of your what? Faith, being much more precious than what? Gold, uh, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what is it that Laodicea is missing? Faith. And by the way, faith risks things for the Lord. Faith doesn't stay in the comfortable position of, uh, of what we know. Faith is willing to step out into the unknown based on a promise, a promise from God. So the very thing that Laodicea misses is what? Faith. And this is what we're to buy from the Lord. I can't tell you how many times... How many times I've talked to Christians who said, why doesn't God work miracles today like he did way long ago? Or how come we don't see miracles in the church today like we did in the New Testament? There is a reason, and it's not a failure on God's part. The failure is a lack of faith, an unwillingness to test and try the Lord. Um... People said evangelism in Portland doesn't work. For decades, churches in Portland have not done evangelism because it doesn't work. And why risk the money? You chose to risk, take a risk for the Lord, and people's lives were forever influenced by the Revelation Today series. If we never would have stepped out in faith, we never would see miracles. Miracles only come in a response to faith. You remember Jesus? He would walk down streets and there would be sick people, people who were lame, people who were blind or, or deaf. And every one of those individuals who was healed, Jesus said to them, brother, your faith has made you well. You want to see miracles in your life? Be willing to step out on faith 
It's not blind faith. That's called presumption. Faith in the promises of God. Step out in faith. Ellen White tells us, brethren, we must have genuine faith, which is the gold tried in the fire. We must cherish that faith, which works by love and purifies the soul. Unless our faith has a purifying influence, it is worthless. Such a faith leads the soul to God and expands the intellect while it purifies and nobles and sanctifies. Let those in youth, those in mature age, and the aged consider that their cases are soon to pass and review before God. What will be the record that they shall meet? What is she saying? She's saying that in the judgment, the one thing that the church of God needs is an experience by faith. Are you testing the Lord? You know, the Bible says, uh, with regards to tithes and offerings, try me now in this, says the Lord. And see if I will not open for you the floodgates of heaven. Tithes and offerings are a test. It's how we exhibit faith and grow faith. The Sabbath is a test. Not working and choosing to not make others work on the Sabbath, that's a test. It's a way that we exhibit our faith. When you come under trial and words, angry words, fill your mind... And by faith, you choose not to speak them to the person who is so irritating to you. But you close your mouth and you go to the Lord in prayer. That's an act of faith. It grows, it grows you internally. This is the experience that God's people need. They need faith. Of all that could constitute true wealth, money, land, stocks, large churches, large congregations, large families, even a happy family, the one thing above all else that God measures as true wealth is genuine faith. Those who have genuine faith are truly rich. In Mark chapter 12, verses 42 through 44, it says, Then one poor widow came and threw in how much? Two mites. It's like a few pennies which make a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury, for they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty. But in all that she, uh, of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood, her gift, was more precious in the sight of God, even though it was... Worthless because it was given in faith. God values faith, friends. He values it when we step out. The widow didn't give for show. Her gift was a revelation of what was in her heart. It revealed that her dependence was not on her ability to provide for herself or others, but her dependence was on God's ability to provide for her. She had genuine faith, and God rewarded that faith. And that faith is the gold refined in the fire that we must buy from the Lord. Now the Laodiceans had money, enough to rebuild their whole city several times. But they lacked the hidden gold that is tested, tried, and true. It was for this reason that they were poor. Jesus bids them, just as he bids us today, to buy from him the very thing we don't have. And that is genuine faith. Now, how are we supposed to buy faith? How do you buy faith? Ask? Yes. Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. But there's a few things that, uh, that we don't realize about faith. Romans chapter 12 verse 3 says, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So here's the question. Do you lack faith? Now some may say, well, yeah, pastor, I lack faith. I mean, I look at all the things that everyone else is doing and they have more faith than me. I lack faith. 
But the Bible says that God gives to each one a what? A measure of faith. Anyone cooked before? Yeah. The most important thing about cooking is that you get the right measurements. I remember one day I decided I was going to cook for my parents. And at that time, I did not know the difference between tablespoons and teaspoons. And the recipe called for two and a half, now I know it's teaspoons, but, uh, but I thought it was tablespoons. I mean, big T, little T, I thought little T's were just a typo. Two and a half tablespoons of nutmeg on potatoes. As it was baking, I thought that the smell was a little strong. But what do I know? I mean, I'm not a professional cook. I'm just doing this as a special gift to my parents. We set the table. I dish them up with a towel folded over my arm. Standing by and I wait for them to take their first bite. My mother bites in. I said, how is it, mom? And my mom said, wonderful, son. <laughs> my dad puts his fork in and he bites it. He says, wonderful. <laughs> how could you say wonderful? This, this, is, uh, this is interesting, son. This is interesting. It was at that moment that I realized that measurements really count. And uh, God doesn't mess up when he gives a measure. God gives to each person a measure of faith. It's not something that you can work up. It's not something that you can um, call down and say, I need more faith, give me more faith. God has given you a measure of faith. Now, if I gave you one cup of flour, what could you do with that flour? Could you make more flour from that one cup of flour? Could you make more flour? No. no. If I gave you a cup of water, could you make more water? No. Only Jesus can make more bread from a few loaves of bread. Only Jesus can make more fish from a few loaves of fish. Here, if I give you a loaf of bread, all you have is one measure of bread, one measure of flour, one measure of water. The only thing you can do with the measure I give you, you can't make more of it. The only thing you can do it is use it. It's the only thing you can do with it is use it. And by the way, I can't give you more until you've used what you've had. And here's a common misunderstanding that many Christians have. They say, I need more faith. In Luke chapter 17, verses 5 and 6, the apostles had this misunderstanding. The apostles came to Jesus and they said, Lord, do what? Increase our faith. Now, if you're asking for more faith, what do you believe? You believe that you don't have enough, right? How many of you through your life have ever believed that you don't have enough faith? Have you ever believed that? You know, we're not, we're, we're not much different from the disciples that lived 2,000 years ago. They came to Jesus. They said, Lord, increase our faith. So the Lord said to them, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. The point is not that we only need uh, a small faith. The point is, is that God gives you the amount of faith that you need for the job he's calling you to do. So whatever God is calling you to do, you have the faith to do it. All you need to do is use the faith. Use the faith that God has given you to step out in the areas God is calling you to step out. He has given to each a measure of faith and God never misses his measure. I was talking to a young girl who was about ready to be baptized and she said, Pastor, I can't be baptized because I don't have the faith of martyrs. And I said... I said, is God calling you to be a martyr today? She said, no. I said, then why would God give you the faith of a martyr if he's not calling you to be a martyr? The day that God calls you to be a martyr, he'll give you the faith of a martyr. 
Use the faith that you have to do what God is calling you to do today. We don't need a lot of faith. We just need to use the faith that God is giving us. Next, Jesus bids Laodicea to buy from him white garment to clothe their nakedness. In Revelation 19, it says, And to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And also in verse 14, it says, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Laodicea, they need a white garment. Later on in Revelation, it says there's a group of people that have white garments. And it says that the white garment is the righteous acts of the saints. Now, where did these saints get these righteous acts from? Because the truth is, is that in Isaiah 64, 6, it says, all we are like an unclean thing. And all our righteousness is like what? Filthy rags. That includes the people right there at the end of Revelation. All their righteousness is like filthy rags. So how are they clothed in white garments? It says, we all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. We are in just as much need of the righteous robe today as were the Laodiceans of that time. Truly, there is none righteous, and their deficiency is our deficiency. Therefore, Jesus' counsel for us, as well as to them, is buy from me white garments that you may be clothed, and the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. What do those white garments represent? They re represent the gift of righteousness given to God's people. Anyone here heard of righteousness by faith? Yeah. What is righteousness by faith? How do we buy this spotless robe from God? What can we offer him to obtain this white garment? With faith, with faith, we, we, we buy it by using it. That's how we buy the gold refined in the fire. We use it. And by the way, just backing up, Christ calls us to buy not just gold, but he says gold refined in the what? In the fire. I'm sure it doesn't take a rocket scientist to think about what the fire represents, right? What's the fire represent? Trials. Hardships. Now, that's why the apostle says, count it all joy, brethren, when you face uh, fiery trials of various kind. Because your faith is being worked out. Your faith is being refined. Sometimes... Um, sometimes the Lord, in order to bring us to a higher place, allows us to go through difficult, difficult moments, fiery trials, where we are forced to step out in faith, where we're forced to reach up our hand in faith, say, Lord, the only way I'm going to get through this is if you carry me. Those moments are needed in every person's life because if you do not go through those moments, you cannot have a faith that is tried in the fire and comes out like gold. You need those moments. Praise God for them and hold on to his promises through them. 2 Peter 1 verse 4 tells us how we, um, how we get this righteousness that we so desperately need. 2 Peter 1.4 says, By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. How do we become partakers of the divine nature? How do you read that verse? Through what? Through the exceedingly precious promises. Are there promises of God that you're holding on to today? When, uh, when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the, in the wilderness, he didn't have nothing to grab from. Every single temptation he met from a promise or statement from the word of God. He held on to something. 
We need something to hold on to as well. And this is why morning and evening devotions in the Word of God are so important. This is when the precious promises of God are implanted in your mind to carry you through the day. You know, uh, Ellen White talks about every day there are trials that we will face that we have never faced before. And, and God has in your Bible reading the very truths that you need, promises that you need to carry you through those trials so that you will not be overcome by Satan. Satan will do all that he can to distract you from the Word of God, to get you off on projects, to get, get you busy, to get you doing a hundred other things so that you miss the instructions of God from His Word and so that He can overcome you with the temptations He has planned for you that day. It is so important. And I would say, your eternal life depends upon a daily walk with the Lord. You need the Word of God every day. Be there, friends. Don't let it slip by. Five minutes is better than no minutes. An hour is the gold standard. But five minutes is better than no minutes. Something in the Word of God feeds your soul. Don't be a weak Christian throughout the week. Gain your strength from the Lord. So here, we get righteousness as we rely upon the promises of God. Through His divine promises, when we place our faith in His promises, we gain righteousness. Now you turn over to Romans, right? Romans chapter 4. What does it say about Abraham? Romans chapter 4 tells us that Abraham... That Abraham, in verse 9, it says, Does the blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the un uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. All right. Did, did Abraham mess up, yes or no? Yes. Is Abraham righteous, yes or no? <laughs> he's not righteous but through faith righteousness was accounted to him so Abraham messed up God comes to Abraham and says Abraham I told you that from the seed of uh, through Sarah you will have a child that will be a promise the promised one Abraham finally has a child with Sarah and God says, no, 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 no. We need to test your faith. Abraham, take your son. The promised son, Isaac. Take him up and sacrifice him there on Mount Moriah. Abraham believed God. And he was willing to sacrifice his son, believing that if his son died... God was able to resurrect his son, Isaac. And as he placed his faith in God, as he placed his faith in God, that faith exhibited in God was accounted to Abraham as righteousness. Satan doesn't want you to receive this message. Gospel Workers, page 161, says, The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God is a precious thought. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented, for he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. If he can control minds so that doubt and unbelief and darkness shall compose the experience of those who claim to be the children of God, he can overcome them with temptation. What is it that takes you out of darkness and unbelief? It's when you place your eyes on Jesus and by faith believe that his righteousness is accounted to you. Praise God. 
Now's a good time to ask the question, what is righteousness by faith? Well, there's two ways that righteousness comes to you. It's called imputed righteousness and imparted righteousness. What is imputed righteousness? Go ahead, read it with me. Jesus' perfect life for you. What is imparted righteousness? Jesus' perfect life in you. Uh, The life that Jesus lived that was perfect, that he gives to you, that's imputed righteousness. The life that Jesus lives through you, him working his righteous life in you, that's called imparted righteousness. You know, there's two other terms that are used for these two righteousness. Imputed righteousness is known as justification, just as if I never sinned. You're accounted in the record books of God because of Jesus as if you never sinned. When you place your faith in him, as if you never sinned. Imparted righteousness, that, the second name for that is sanctification. This is the working of holiness in your life. God transforming you and making you like himself. Christ's righteousness is a gift to us. As a gift to us is imparted righteousness Christ's righteousness manifested in our own lives is imputed righteousness. So righteousness by faith must include both of these experiences. Before we we can become new creatures in Christ, we must receive his gift of a spotless record by faith. If we have received his gift of righteousness, then our lives will demonstrate this as we gain the victory over sin through faith in his power and his promises. This is the experience that God says that the Laodicean church needs. So how is it that that group at the end of Revelation could have pure and spotless robes? Two reasons. Number one, they have the righteousness of Christ imputed to them by faith. Number two, they have the righteousness of Christ manifested in them. This is the mystery of godliness. Christ in you, the hope of glory. There are two things that the Christian needs if they're going to pass through the judgment. This is the spotless robe. Number one, you must place your faith in Christ. You must place your faith in his promises. You must place your faith in his good works to save you. And to bring you and and his ability to present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. And number two, you must allow his grace to work in you so that sin no longer finds a place in your life. A Christian must gain victory over sin through the power of Christ because we can't gain victory over sin in our own power. This will be the experience of God's people at the end of time. They will be clothed with the righteousness of Christ and Christ's righteousness will be manifested in them and through them. Buy from me, he says, uh, white raiment. Buy from me white raiment. That's the message to Laodicea. This experience is also known as conversion. To Nicodemus, Jesus said, you must be born again. This is receiving that white raiment. You must be born again. Conversion. Transformed through a living faith in Christ unless we obtain this experience. We cannot see heaven, friends. We should pray for it, yearn for it, spend time searching out how I can be converted. You remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus. Let's read it together. John 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be born again? It means that your old nature goes and a new nature comes. You aren't living the same if you're born again. By the way, the process of sanctification happens over a lifetime. Justification happens the moment you place your faith in Jesus. You must be born again. There are some today who 
who are happy to receive justification without sanctification that will never walk the streets of gold. Happy to receive the righteousness of Christ without giving up a single sin in their life. They'll never walk the streets of gold. There are others who are working ferociously to rid their life of every sin, but they are not relying upon the merits or the power of Jesus Christ. And they too will weep and howl at the second coming of Jesus. We must have Christ's righteousness for us and Christ's righteousness in us if we will be with Jesus Christ throughout eternity. And that is the work that God is doing in the church of Laodicea at the end of time. A work of reformation and transformation. Now the final ingredient that we need, that Laodicea needed, was real eye salve. Why? Well, because they're blind. They don't see their problem. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 14 says that, But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. Here we have a picture of a group that needs this eye salve. They're reading the Bible. Obviously churchgoers obviously know the Old Testament. Obviously spending time in the Word of God, but they're spending time in the Word of God in vain because they do not have a, the veil removed. How is the veil removed? What is this veil? 2 Corinthians 3.14 tells us, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing whose mind the God of this age has blinded who do not believe. When you don't believe the word of God, when you don't place your faith by action in the word of God, it blinds you from being able to see the true condition of your heart. It is only as we move forward by faith and receive God's word by faith that our eyes are open and we can see our true condition. Faith is the key that removes the veil. Faith in Christ. Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God should shine on them. Satan will do all that he can to hide the true meaning of God's word through unbelief, through lack of faith in God's promises. So, when, so that when we read the Bible, it's a closed book. But friends, when we choose to distrust God's word and God's promises, we are cutting ourselves off from the light of truth. Cultivating distrust in God or his, or his word brings in blindness and hardness of heart. Once this comes, the only way that the veil can be removed is by placing our faith in Jesus, repenting of our sins and turning to Him. As long as we harbor an attitude of distrust or unbelief, we can't receive the Laodicean message. You know, it's interesting that Laodicea comes from two words. Laos, meaning people, and Decea, meaning judge. Literally, it's the people in the judgment. Laodicea is for all of those who have received the third angel's message or the three angels' message. It outlines the final work of God's people at the end of time to place their faith in Christ so that they can gain a true experience with Him. By faith to receive righteousness, Christ's righteousness imparted and imputed, justification and sanctification in our lives. And through belief and through the power of the Holy Spirit to have our eyes open to the truth of God that we can walk in His light. You know, Revelation 14 verse 7 reveals clearly that there is a judgment taking place prior to the coming of Jesus. Daniel 7 verses 9 through 11 reveals that this judgment is taking place in heaven. Daniel 8 14 reveals the prophetic time period that this judgment would begin. October 22, 1844. And the message to Laodicea in Revelation 3 verses 14 through 22 reveals what needs to happen internally in the lives of God's people before the judgment closes. 
This must happen before we can be sealed. It must happen before the seven last plagues. It must happen before the time of trouble. Must happen in our lives. If the church does not undergo true conversion, if the church does not receive Christ's imputed and imparted righteousness before the judgment closes, we will not be sealed and cannot expect to be saved because once Christ finishes his work in the most holy place, there will no longer be an intercessor for mankind in the heavenly sanctuary. His work of atonement and intercession are finished when the judgment closes. Revelation 14, 7 tells us, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the seas and the sea springs of water. In early writings, page 280, she says, it was impossible for the plagues to be poured out while Jesus officiated in the sanctuary. But as his work there is finished and his intercession closes, there is nothing to stay the wrath of God and it breaks with fury upon the shelterless heads of the guilty sinner who has slighted salvation and hated reproof in that fearful time after the close of Jesus' mediation, the saints were living in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor for every case was decided and the jewels were numbered. When probation closes, you're sealed, friends. But that sealing cannot happen unless you have bought from him gold refined in the fire. Unless you have clothed yourself with his white raiment unless you have the eye salve of the Holy Spirit, unless these things take place, we will not be sealed. And when probation closed, there are some that are saved and there are some that are lost. When the time of trouble comes and the plagues fall, it's too late at that point. Now is the time where Christ has given you and he has given me a work to do a work of heart searching, a work of heart rending, a work of seeking out sin in our life, confessing that sin and receiving the power of Christ over those sins in our life. Now is the time that God has given you. You are Laodicea, a people of the judgment. Today God is standing at the door of your heart. To Laodicea, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Today, Christ is knocking on your heart's door. One sin persistently cherished is enough to keep us from the kingdom of heaven. Today is the day when you and I have the opportunity when we have the opportunity to give to the Lord those things in our life that we've been hiding in the corners. Today, God calls upon you to give your life to Him. Today, God calls upon you to accept His righteousness by faith. To repent of your sins and say, Lord, search me and try me and see if there is any wicked way in me like to make an appeal and give you an opportunity to respond. Today, as you hear the Holy Spirit calling you to repent of your sins and by faith accept the righteousness of Jesus for you and His righteousness in you, I'd like to invite you to make your decision today to repent of those sins by standing. Standing to your feet, say, Lord, there are areas in my life that I want to repent in your sight today. Lord, I need your righteousness in my life today. Lord, I need you to work a work inside of me that I might be a new creature before you today. 
Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I promise you, I will come into you and dine with you and you with me to a Laodicean church. Christ calls us to repentance, but Christ calls you to make a further commitment. You've stood to say you repent of your sins. You've stood today to accept Christ's righteousness by faith. But today there is someone who needs to make a further stand and say, I need to give my life publicly to Jesus Christ. I want to make it publicly known that my life belongs to Jesus Christ. Today the Lord is calling you to make a decision to be baptized. I want you to think about this. Jesus didn't die on the cross in some dark corner. Jesus died in the cross for you in a public way. All saw his shame. All saw his, his nakedness. All saw him bear your sins to the tree. And if Jesus would do that for you, can't you do it for him? Step forward in faith for him and say, Lord, I want to give my life in a public way to you and show that I died to self that you might reign in my life. Today, Jesus stands at your door. He calls you to make a decision by coming to the front today. Say, Lord, I give my life to you. I want to be baptized. Is there somebody here today who the Lord is calling on your heart? Somebody here in this building who God is speaking to you at this moment saying, I want you, brother, I want you, sister, to give your life to me. Do you hear the voice of the Lord? Come down. Come down, I want to have a special prayer for you just now. Laodicea. Baptize, maybe rebaptize. But God is calling on you today to make a decision for Him. You don't have forever, friend. You don't have eternity. But you do have today. Jesus says, you are my child. Respond to me. I gave my life for you. Respond to me today. Amen. Praise God. Is there another here who hears the voice of God? Praise God. Amen. Judgment's going to close, friends. Now's the time to make your decision for the Lord. If you have not been baptized, you want to be rebaptized. Make a public stand for the Lord today. This will seal it between you and the Lord. You walk forward today, you're not going to turn back. You're going to follow Him all the way. One last appeal. If God is moving upon your heart to be baptized, to join God's remnant church and to give your life to Him throughout eternity, come forward right now. Don't wait. Don't wait. the Lord. Amen. Let's bow our heads together, please. Join me in kneeling, actually. Can you join me in kneeling? Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for calling us to a commitment to you today. Thank you, Lord, for your word which pleads with us while mercy's door stands open still. Thank you, Father, for calling us out of sin to a life of repentance and faith in you. Thank you for calling those who have come forward today to give their life to you. 
some for baptism, some for rebaptism. Maybe even there are some who are still struggling in their seats just now. Lord, I ask that you would bless the decisions that are being made right now. I pray for the Holy Spirit to be poured out upon those who, are, who have made a decision, who have come forward and have stood to their feet today. We pray, Lord, for that faith which you give, a measure of faith. We pray, Lord, for boldness to step forward by faith in you. We pray, Lord, for your righteousness, that your righteousness may cover us. We ask for your mercy, Lord, for we need your mercy. We ask for your forgiveness, for we need your forgiveness over our sins, Lord. We ask for your grace. And I pray, Lord, that as these ones are baptized here in the next couple weeks, that you would bless their decision through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. And we pray it all in the precious and wonderful and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Just want to invite those who came forward. Would you be willing to sit in this open pew just right here, please? Just right here in this open pew. That's okay. All right. I just want to talk with you afterward, after we sing the closing, um, the closing song. I invite you to join me in standing as we sing our closing hymn together. Please turn to 315, or Song of Dedication. Oh, for a closer walk with God, 315.
Gracious Lord, what a... What a beautiful way to end this service. Lord, we lay all our idols at your feet that we may worship you and you alone. Bless us now, Lord, as we continue from this place. May the message of Laodicea never start burning in our hearts and minds until we're there with you at your second coming. Thank you, Lord. We ask for this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The deacons will usher out the, uh, the congregation. And we invite you to join us for a guest luncheon downstairs. God bless.